We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This is Jeremy McFarland for the Sports History Network and for the Football is Family podcast. One of the best things about hosting a football sports podcast is the fact that I get to read a, a book about a topic, a person, or an event, and then get to talk to that author about the book that he or she wrote. Today's episode is no different. Today, we talked to John Eisenberg, who's written several books about different aspects of sports history. Today's episode focuses mainly on his book, The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. I have included a link in the show notes to his personal webpage where you can purchase this book and the other books that he has written. And while you're at it, head over to the Sports History Network website. I have the link also provided in the show notes. We have so many great podcasts available. We have great men and women who are working diligently to to make this your single stop for the sports yesteryear. Make sure you subscribe to each and every one of them and give them a rating. You can follow the Footballers Family podcast on Twitter at Jeremy underscore McFarlane or on the Footballers Family Facebook page. And we're back to Footballers Family, and I've got a special guest that I've been looking forward to ever since I had the chance to read his book, The League. I'll let him introduce himself. Will you, my friend? Yeah, I'm John Eisenberg. Uh, I'm a sports writer for many years in Baltimore and uh, the author of 10 books now, uh, in, 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 several on pro football history. Yeah, and I was looking through some of them, and uh, the first season, the, a book about Vince Lombardi, I'm looking forward to reading that. And I have gone through this, and I haven't picked it up yet, but I will now. Ten Gallon War, the book about the Cowboys and the uh, the Texans, the Dallas Texans. And uh, I didn't realize just how deep that battle was uh, between the NFL and the AFL until I did a little bit more research. So that's, that's, that's not right now, though. The one I want to talk about today is the book, The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. <laughs> You brought some stuff up in this book that I have that I don't think I've ever heard about. Um, or maybe if I did, I didn't really think about it. This the NFL was not a moneymaker at the very beginning. No, and, and that's really why uh, why I wound up writing this book and taking this approach. Uh, I actually was a, uh, I have a, a literary agent in New York and he's well connected and he was approached by an editor who uh, an editor at Basic Books, a publisher in New York, and the editor said, hey, I want to do a book on early football, early days of pro football. And my agent said, okay. Uh, you know, and the editor said, do you have a writer? And my agent said, yeah, I have one. So uh, that was me. And I got in touch with this editor and he said, I want to do a book on early football. I said, great. And he, then he said, so tell me what the story is. And that threw me a little bit. I haven't had that. It was like, it was up to me. Okay, what is the story here. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized what the story was. I mean, books have been written about Red Grange and a lot of the great football players, Bronco Nagurski from that era. I thought that ground had been covered. But what had not been covered really was, as you pointed out, uh, the NFL in the first years was basically a failure. It was a failure for a number of years. And so how did we get from there uh, where teams are folding and there's no money on the table to where we are now, which is $15 billion in annual revenues or whatever it is. So I set out to tell that story and focused on the owners who really carried the league through those early years when when it was a failing enterprise, pretty much. How did they sort of turn it around, save it in those tough years, and then turn it around and set it in the right direction? That's the story. 
you did, uh, and, and I like how you weave the book together. You dealt with five people, and I don't think I'm giving away the the book if I mention these people. Uh, Tim Mara, George Hallis, uh, George Preston Marshall, Art Rooney, and Burt Bell. And you basically made, give the, gave them their own chapters, but you weave them together in, in a beautiful way. And I was very impressed with how you would take one topic and you would talk about them. He said, well, these guys are still here, over here. And they're all working together to to uh, move the NFL. Um, one of the stories that I enjoyed, I, I guess I shouldn't have been enjoyed it because I know it wasn't good for them, but I guess it worked out, is how George Hallis um, had to finagle a lot of people to keep his team going. Oh, boy, did he ever uh, have to finagle. Yes, I mean, the, 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 real, the real point in NFL history, I mean, the 1920s, the league was started in 1920, the first decade. It was franchises coming and going and uh, weird scheduling and no playoffs. And they were just sort of making it up as they went along. And uh, it, it was it was a it was just a sort of a nothing enterprise. And then but where it really struggled and barely made it was once the Depression hit yes. uh, and the stock market crashed. And there was just no money, no fans, anything, how they keep going. So George Hallis. That, that was probably the most amazing thing I, I, I found out in my research for this book. But there was a year uh, where it came to an end, and he told players, Red Grange and Bronco Nagurski, some of the most famous players in NFL history, he, he gave them IOUs instead of salary because they didn't have the money to give them. And uh, it was Hallis's grandson who told me this story, who now runs the Bears, George McCaskey. Uh, and he said, the amazing part about that story is they took the IOUs. These guys said, OK, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all right, we, we think. And they came back to play. And it was like, well, OK, maybe this guy in the long run is going to figure it out. It was a real show of faith. And so but he you know, it was uh, the difference between making it and not making it at one point was like the money he was getting from the ads and the program. And it wasn't a lot of money. There was just no money on the table. And House was just scrimping and saving everything he could to, 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 to get through. He didn't come from his working class roots. Mm -hmm. Some of these other guys were a little richer. He was not. So he was really working hard to keep it going. Well, what got me is he was borrowing from his children's college. <laughs> yes. Fund. yes. Yes. And his daughter uh, told me that story. Uh, well, I, I think daughter, she's, I think she's okay now. Yeah. She's doing all right. Uh, the bear said Virginia McCaskey, Hallis's yeah. daughter, she's 90. She's in her mid nineties. I think she owns the Chicago Bears. Uh, they're worth three billion dollars or whatever it is. So that several thousand that she gave her dad out of her college fund, I think, worked out okay. It did. It did. Um, Tim Mara, uh, I didn't realize, and I'm glad you brought that up. He made a lot of money from horses. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, horse racing was very big in the twenties, and okay. uh, much more popular than pro football, uh, more popular than just about anything except major league baseball, probably. Uh, yeah. and, uh, yeah, he was a bookie. I mean, can you imagine today, of course it's all changed now that the NFL is embracing gambling, but, uh, uh, for many, many years, they were worried about that. And, but Tim Mara, that's he was a legal bookmaker in New York city. Uh, this is the years before there where you go to the racetrack before it was all computerized. Uh, we're really, you know, getting into horse racing history here, but it used to be you'd walk in and everybody had a bookie. There was a row of them and you would put your money with a guy and bet odds. He did that at the New York tracks and did it very well and made a lot of money. And, uh, they were kind of celebrities. It was in the newspapers and everything. And no, so did our big, big, I'm sorry. Oh, no, get, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, he was he was he was big into that, and and they, it funded a very nice lifestyle for him. Well, did Art Rooney have something to do with that as well? Well, Art Rooney was a gambler, flat out gambler. The guy that started the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, was probably one of the best horse players in the history of the United States. Uh, many years later, when the Steelers were good and he was an old man winning Super Bowls, people would would they'd show the camera on him. He had a cigar, and it was kind of cute and. And, uh, you know, he was a very genial sportsman. But back in the day, that guy could make money at the betting window. Like, I mean, he never worked a day in his life. Uh, he, he, if he really needed money, uh, he would go to the racetrack and uh, was really, really good at it. And all this stuff was in the newspapers. You could find it. 
you research it. Uh, there was one summer uh, he was making so much money that he was a celebrity. They were writing about it. You know, people would cheer him. He was walking to the betting window. This little guy with a cigar waddling up to the betting window. But uh, he was really, really good at it. And so there was a lot of sort of gambling and, and horse playing in the early days of the NFL. Well, I don't know if they would uh, – if that would go over well today, but it did then. Uh, did he uh, – did you get to talk to any of the Roonies? Yes, I did. I spoke actually to the late Dan Rooney uh, before he passed away. Uh, I went to their training camp one day and had a nice visit with him uh, and Art Jr., mm. uh, who's still alive and is a key figure in the history of the team more a- after the years that I'm writing about. I mean, he became a scout and he was a tremendous scout. When the Steelers started winning Super Bowls with a lot of those uh, African-American players and a lot of them from small colleges or historically black colleges. Art Rooney did a lot. Junior did a lot of the scouting. And uh, it's an amazing story in itself. But he, he's 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 a great raconteur. And so uh, I, I did speak to both those Rooneys. That's just hearing the names come up. It, it's uh, <laughs> one of the guys that I didn't know about was George Marshall. Um. I don't know if uh, well, you you'll have to read the stories to see. He wasn't the best person you'll ever meet in your life, but I didn't realize he made his money off of laundromats. Yeah, well, not laundromats so much as it would be the nineteen twenties version of dry cleaning. You know, cleaning. you would you would take people would take in, and they had it was all over Washington. He had a, a chain of them. You bring in your clothes. And of course, Washington was a government town then as it is now. And so there's a lot of people living in apartments and and they needed somewhere to, you know, to get their clothes cleaned. And he just found a niche and he, he made a lot of money in, in that business. And no, he was not the greatest guy ever. He's probably the biggest racist in the history of the NFL. I mean, even uh, I mean, they went they went 12 years without having an African-American player in the league. Uh, from 34 to 40 through 45. And that was probably his doing for the most part. He was very influential. And, uh, you know, he didn't segregate, he didn't integrate the Redskins until the 1960s. So uh, an amazing figure. However, also, I mean, every day I wrote this book, uh, I I thanked whomever, the literary gods for George Marshall as a character, because he's fascinating. Because not only that's the bad side of him, the good side of him was he was hugely influential in the history of the league uh, in terms of making it more interesting, exciting product, uh, the forward pass, uh, you know, playoffs. He basically invented the playoffs. Yes. Uh, and did all sorts of things. So just a tremendous figure, really, really interesting guy. Now, uh, one of the stories, and I want to see if I can get the names right. I think it was Hallis and Marshall ended up getting almost into a fight in the middle of the, of the uh, field one time. Is that the two I'm thinking of? Yeah. And that yeah. Hallis's wife was getting on to Marshall and she, and he said, don't talk to him. Like, don't talk about him that way. He's my best friend. He's my best friend. And they'd almost just gotten in a fight. I love that story. It was during the 1937 championship game. Uh, just a crazy story. There was a the roughest guy on the field was playing without a helmet, still doing that in 1937. And he slammed into some guy in the sidelines and they, started a brawl and benches emptied and you know that's uh, Hallis and Marshall end up jaw to jaw their teams are playing this is a championship game they're playing for the championship and uh ultimately you know we're separated and cooler heads prevailed as you always say uh but the, the rea- they were best friends uh and to me that story really illustrates the nut of what I was trying to get to which was these guys were rivals on the field. They fought each other for championships. They would try to screw each other any way they could. Uh, however, they were partners too. They were business partners in the business of pro football, and they understood that that mattered more than anything. If they weren't partners, this whole thing was going to go down. So uh, they made many, many decisions along the way that uh, not in the heat of the moment, not on the field during a championship game. They made many decisions that were for the greater good instead of their own best interest. And uh, that is really the way that they grew the sport from uh, the, the, the failure of the 1920s into the success that it became. Now, uh, and I, I get you for a couple more minutes, Mr. John, thank you for your time today. Uh, one of the stories that I, that I really enjoyed from your, from your book is how the bears actually saved the giants 
and it was with um i believe it was with red grange oh well yes yeah, so you're going back to the 1920s there yes yeah uh yeah the first year of the new york giants uh, tim mara started them he bought them for 500 dollars and started them. he didn't really know anything about football wasn't even that interested in it but he started it he thought well you know maybe my kids will like it or something and and uh, they were uh, running out of money uh, and didn't have a lot of fans and pro football was barely making it. And then Red Grange, who was the most famous player uh, in that era, he turned pro after his final year at Illinois, fall of 1925. And the Bears signed him and they went on a barnstorming tour. Very, very famous. They just went around the country. Uh, they realized that there was a hunger to see Red Grange. And so they went around the country playing teams, other teams selling a lot of tickets and um, you know, it sort of introduced pro football really to America. And when they came to New York, uh, 70,000 people showed up to watch him at Yankee stadium. Uh, so, you know, they'd never 70,000 people was twice as many as they'd had for every game, you know, total for the season uh, just suddenly and, and made a lot of, they made a lot of money and that allowed the giants to continue. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it was a real stroke. Uh, of genius by the Bears and Hallis to, to, to get Grange under contract and then go around the country with him and show everybody what pro football was all about. Can you imagine what it would have been like in the NFL without the Giants? Oh, my goodness. Uh, the Giants. Uh, you know, when I, when I, I mean, I'm a fan and I mean, I've been a sports writer many years and a fan. And this was the first time I really dug into the history early history of the NFL. And I was fascinated by it. the impact of the giants, as you said, just tremendous there. They were like the first team to draw fans like 1930. Suddenly people are coming to see the New York giants in a baseball town, New York. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, it's, they're just hugely important in, in, in the history of the league and all these teams are, you know, the bears also goes without saying, uh, you know, the, they were there for the for the origin of the league, the only ones. And so, uh, yeah, those two teams really, really carried it through the first two now, decades. Now, I always um, the Steelers, their, their name were not they were not the Steelers at the very beginning. Right. Uh, the Eagles were not the Eagles from the very beginning. I always think I, I think it's funny hearing how George Hallis rationalized uh, naming his team the Bears. I just thought that was funny where, uh, you know, they played in Wrigley Field. Yeah. And they and played with the Cubs. Well, football players are bigger than baseball players, so we need to be the Bears. I just think right. that's funny. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's amazing how simple stories are. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, oh. One last thing, and then I'll let you go, my friend. Um, and, again, appreciate your time. Uh, Burt Bell uh, – came from a wealthy family, but lost everything through gambling and everything like that. Um, he bought the Eagles or he founded the Eagles. I should say, yep. how did they get the name? The Eagles. I, I want to hear the people, the people to hear this story. Oh gosh. You're testing me a little bit, but he was walking down the street uh, and they had just gotten the franchise. He's walking down the street in Philadelphia and he saw it was a depression era uh, a billboard. He saw a billboard that said, you know, the economic, I can't remember the exact name of the federal program yes. that it was, the economic recovery, not unlike what's going on now, uh, but, you know, it was, they yeah. were in a depression. The federal economic, uh, I don't know the name of the program, but there was a bald eagle on it because it was the federal government. Uh, and he saw this sign and he said, huh. He's walking down Center City, Philadelphia, and he said, oh, the Eagles. Oh, that looks good. Eagles. Let's call them the Eagles. <laughs> Nothing more than that. So, uh, and he borrowed his wife's money. To, uh, you know, it was his wife's money that started the team. So uh, these guys, they were real characters. They were. And, and this book, uh, how can we get a hold of this book, The League? Well, it's everywhere. It's, uh, it's certainly on Amazon, uh, anywhere. Uh, you know, it's a major publisher, wide distribution. I've sold a ton of them on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or books a million or wherever you normally get books, they can get it for you. Uh, you know, it's, it's out there. You have um, several books like 10 gallon war that first season and cotton bowl days, which I'm also interested in looking. And then you have the one that, uh, that when we get off of uh, recording, I want to talk to you about uh, the streak. 
uh, since you are in Baltimore, you have, uh, I'm sure you have a lot to do with Cal Ripken there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I worked for the Baltimore Sun for 23 years. I wrote a lot more baseball than football back in the day. Right. And uh, yeah, I was there for all the all Ripkins. That's the story of his consecutive game streak. So it's, that just came out a few years ago. Uh, like I said, I'll talk to you just a second after we, we get through recording. Uh, and you have some books over racing, horse racing. So you are definitely uh, into a lot of different uh, sports and I appreciate your time. And if anybody wants to follow you on Twitter, how can they follow you? Yeah, it's at B more Eisenberg at B M B more Eisenberg and all my stuff. I'm still writing daily sports columns. Uh, uh, you can find me uh, Ray Baltimore Ravens, digital channels, uh, you know, Ravens.com. Oh, you're uh, hurting me app or whatever. Oh, so, you're hurting me. I, I didn't know if you were going to bring up the Ravens. You're hurting me. <laughs> I see your Titans hat. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's, it's, it's still a little sore. It's still. Uh, uh, well, what goes around comes around, right? So uh, oh, he just <laughs> he just went there. Oh yeah, I, I. But the big thing is, I didn't dance on your uh, on your uh, oh. logo mainly because I can't dance. My <laughs> yeah. wife tells I, me I, to quit. I don't. I don't get into that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. John. I appreciate your time. Sure, it was my pleasure. I appreciate the invitation and I enjoyed being with you. All right. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of you Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items. Plus, get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.